Why did you want to be a cosmonaut? It's a complicated question. I tried to answer it myself a couple of times, and I couldn't find one answer for it. I think it's a combination of a dream and the circumstances, or good luck. So it's a dream from childhood that I was able to realize. Yes, I was dreaming of becoming a cosmonaut when I was a child. With the passage of time, the certainty that I would become a cosmonaut became weaker. However, later, there were some circumstances that allowed me to realize my dream. So this is what happened. What was it as a child that, that made that something that was attractive to you? In my childhood, I was reading a lot of fantasy and science fiction. You know, those writers, authors of the 50s and 60s, who were really inspired by the first flight to space when the first person landed on the moon, when they saw that humankind is very close to deep space exploration. So they were writing a lot of books and novels about it. So they also wrote books how people from the Earth meet with people from other planets or creatures from other planets. So I read a lot of those books while I was a child, so I was dreaming of becoming one of the heroes or characters of these books. So maybe this helped me uh, shape my dream. Let me find out some more about that. Tell me about your hometown. Tell me about where you grew up and, and what your childhood was like. It's very difficult for me to answer this question because my father is a military officer, and we were moving a lot in the country. And I was living in different countries. I was born in Simferopol, that is Ukraine. It's a different country right now. A couple of decades ago, it was part of the Soviet Union. But I finished school and was a grown up already, but it was in Moscow. But other cities and towns that were visited are very close to me. I love St. Petersburg very much. So that, and that's a different kind of, of growing up experience than, uh, than a lot of people have. But it sounds like you, you enjoyed being the, the military child. I didn't have a choice. <laughs> did, did that in influence uh, your choice of, of uh, education when it came time to go to, to university? Yes, definitely. But here, there is also a combination of a dream and the circumstances. I decided to become uh, a military officer as well, like my father, my grandfather. However, I kept dreaming about space, and while I was, I had to select my major, I was very careful about it, and I became a military surgeon in the area of aerospace medicine. Again, going back to those books that I read as a child, I understood it very clearly that all space missions had a surgeon as part of their crew. So I thought it was interesting and it was useful in my life on Earth. That is why I entered the military medical academy. So this is how it happened. Take us on from, from that point and, and 
tell me about the, the high points in your education and your career that ultimately led you to be selected as a cosmonaut. After I graduated from the Military Medical Academy, maybe it was fate or it was still my dream. At each crossroads uh, where I had to think which path to choose, after I graduated, I got a chance to start working for the GCTC in Star City. Of course, it was a great opportunity to me. I started working there as a surgeon, aerospace surgeon. I was working at GCTC and during seven years before I was selected to the cosmonaut corps. I was a flight surgeon, I was running medical experiments, I was a physiology expert, so I was supporting the crew during their spacewalks. So I was very familiar with these areas before I became cosmonaut. And now, as a cosmonaut, you're uh, one of only, actually only a little more than 200 different human beings who've ever been on board this, uh, this space station uh, so far. Um, what are your hopes about how this mission is going to inspire future space travelers, future little children who read science fiction and, and want to be cosmonauts and astronauts? During this upcoming flight, I want to spend more time to promote space flights among young people. I want to show, I want to tell children on Earth what life in space looks like, how space is wonderful, how our planet is wonderful, and how interesting it is to fly on modern spacecraft, control modern systems, how useful it is and how efficient it is to work in this area. At the same time, I will try to post new pictures to my photo gallery or maybe have some blog or Twitter to share my impressions with the general public. Maybe I will have some short videos, we'll make short videos for children about physical and chemical um, experiments during the space flight. So I hope I will have um, a chance to talk to university students, school students, uh, over ham sessions. When people do a job like this that is, requires so much time and so much focus, and in this case, not some small measure of risk, uh, you've got some reason behind it. Tell me what it is you think that we're learning. What, what are we getting as a result of flying people like you into space that makes it worth doing? I think it's a human instinct. It's a desire to explore other places to live. You can ask the same question uh, to a seaman who is discovering new land, new shores, trying to find a new life. You can ask the same question to people who um, go to the mountains, who swim in the caves. So I think it's in our blood. It's what makes us different from the rest of the world, from animals. It's a desire to understand the world around you, to expand the area where we live, to explore the space, Mars, Moon, other star systems. So it's a question about a desire to learn something new. 
You and your crewmates are next in line to launch to the International Space Station. Ali, tell me what the goals of your mission are and, and what your jobs are going to be on this flight. First of all, the main goal of our mission will not be much different from the goals of previous missions, especially lately. Mostly our work will be focused on experiments, uh, modernizing of the station, taking care of our station, effective, efficient life on board the station. We will work with a lot of enthusiasm. We will be very inspired during our work, and our work will be mostly devoted to science. Now, you've been to the station twice before. Uh, what are you most looking forward to seeing when you get back there this time? I don't expect to see any big changes on board the station. The station hasn't changed much since my last flight. A couple of small modules have been added. It will be interesting to see them, explore them. But I'm looking forward to seeing the station again to see how the life organization has changed on board the station because every crew brings something new to the station, to its life, their own style, and it all stays there. It's like a growing organism. Every year, every mission brings something new, something changes. They add something to the station. Well, it might seem that the station is the same, the people are the same, but you see a little bit different person, the same thing with the station. So I'm looking forward to seeing the station again to see what it is today. Now, the assembly of the station is pretty much complete. Uh, and. So the emphasis for the crews is on doing the science that you that you do while you keep the station flying. Now, recently, the program decided to send two crew members there for a full year to help add more data about how that environment affects people. Uh, what do you think about the idea of uh, longer flights to the station? In any case, it's an expected step in our space exploration, especially manned exploration uh, flights. For Russia, it's nothing new. Soviet space science has had that uh, step in their development. They had such flights. However, at this stage of our development, uh, with us having this equipment that we currently have on board the station and on Earth, the result can be really impressive. We do need such flights. We need such flights to understand how to make long-term existence of a human being in space safer, how to make explorations of deep space, of the moon, of other planets. The crew needs to understand that they can reach other planets being in good uh, health, complete their mission successfully, and they can safely come back. So they all need to understand that. That is why a year-long mission is only an intermediate stage in our development. I think we will have missions that will be longer. Six months flight, very useful too. We can collect a lot of data during these missions as well. We can understand how to control the station, how to make the flight more independent, how to eliminate the effects of zero gravity on a human being. So it's still very interesting projects and year-long missions and even longer missions is a very useful and interesting thing. Would you like to go for a whole year at a time? Of course, every researcher, every astronaut or cosmonaut who are explorers 
wants to go to the station, they want to understand themselves, they want to understand the station, they want to help scientists answer their questions. And I hope that our scientific program will be interesting and a lot will be happening during this year. Now, you've spent a pretty much a year uh, on the station already in two six-month uh, pieces. So you have a pretty good experience of what being in that environment does to you, does, it does to your body. Uh, from your own experience as well as from your, your professional experience as a doctor, what is it what is it that we should be working on in order to maximize our ability to send people out into space for longer periods of time? Here we need to talk about two things. First is we need to ensure it from a medical standpoint and second from a psychological standpoint. So both these aspects are very important if we want to send a person to space. If we are talking about a physiological and medical aspect, then we need to develop countermeasures. How we can use healthcare, pharmacology to help a person survive that, how to help a person exercise enough to eliminate those effects. So there should be a combination of all these aspects. However, they should not take a lot of time on board the station. If we look at the station today, each crew member has two and a half hours of exercise sessions a day. If we improve something and achieve some success in our research, we can save one hour a day of crew time. And the second aspect I was talking about is a psychological aspect, being in a contained space space station is a very difficult experience on its own and judging by my own experience the most important thing here is to have informational support feeling distant feeling far away from the earth is a difficult aspect so we need to receive some information from earth and social networks can help talking to our friends can help so you should not lose all that um, connection with the earth and the information of earth. Talking to your families, people close to you helps as well. And after my second flight, I concluded that it's the most important thing is to be loaded, snowed under work. The worst for me was when I had some spare time. When people on Earth, planners, think that they are doing a good thing, giving us some days off, when on Earth you can simply visit your friends, uh, meet with your friends somewhere, for us it's like a day off in the office. <laughs> so it's really difficult. A lot of the work that you're going to do on the station is designed to gather data to find out exactly how the body is affected by uh, this environment, physically and psychologically. Give me two or three examples of, of the kinds of experiment work that you're going to be involved in on this flight that is both designed to gather that data, but also is, is ultimately is helping people who are on Earth and never go to the station. So, I can name one experiment per area, per scientific area. For example, we have an experiment where we can assess relationships uh, within the crew, how these relationships change over time. So, using special procedure, each crew member assesses the behavior or its his her relationships with other crewmates, and he or she also assesses relationships with friends and families on Earth and how the attitude, how the relationships change. So it's a very interesting experiment 
that shows changes of psychological climate for a crewmate. From a physiological and healthcare standpoint, we have an experiment that will help us assess changes of biomechanical processes, how we move in space, how our cardiovascular system works, or how our respiratory system changes. We change the way we breathe in space. So the saturation, oxygen saturation processes change. It's extremely interesting. And finally, the uh, intracranial pressure changes are very serious problems that we need to address, intraocular press, uh, pressure changes. So we need to develop some procedures, measures, how we can protect crewmates from that. So this helps not only crewmates, but people on Earth as well. If we invent some methods how to cope with that on orbit, we'll be able to use that on Earth as well. Another interesting experiment that is mostly related to station control is how we can increase the uh, self-containment of the station. All technical solutions, control solutions, are mostly taken by mission control centers in Houston and Moscow. So they're analyzing the data and they make their own decisions. And they have special teams who are involved in that. So, and the crew is not participating directly in these processes. So they simply follow the recommendations. If we make one more step in our future, we will see that making this station independent will help us a lot. MCC workload will be much less in this case. So here they will be simply sending our signals, uh, their signals. They will arrange call with the station and the crew will make their own decisions and do their job very well. This will help MCCs and crews to work more efficiently when they have delays in COM. Sometimes these delays might take one hour, two hours, so this changes the whole pace of work. I'm not talking only about decision-making process, but also about um, emergency situations or off normal situations about controlling the station. So we have a couple of technological experiments uh, that will tackle that during our mission. I'm remembering what happened during Expedition 15 and the station lost control and there were communications issues. Uh, this would seem to, to fit right in uh, along those lines. It's a very good example what happened during Expedition 15 when the Earth could not control the station anymore and the crew was able to save the station. It was, a, it was a very interesting uh, bit of time there, I, I remember. Um, I think it was the most significant of nominal situation that ever happened on board the station. Those are very good examples of, of some of the kinds of science research you and your crewmates will be involved in. There are others, too. There are, are special equipment in the various laboratories in the station that are there specifically for you to do work in other, uh, other areas, other scientific disciplines. Uh, give me a couple of examples of the other kinds of, of science research that will occupy some of your time. For example, an experiment when we monitor the surface of Earth. During our flight, we will install two telescopes outside the station that have 
specifically been developed to monitor the surface of the Earth automatically on a permanent basis. We were doing part of this experiment on the two segments of the stations, but we were mostly taking pictures manually via the windows of the station. But of course, it had some drawbacks. We received a lot of materials, a lot of data, and that is why we had to make a step forward, and we decided to make this capability possible. So right now we have a capability to take pictures automatically with different resolution. So we have the equipment that we can install outside the station. So during one of our EVAs we will do that. Um, one of these experiments will be devoted to the ionosphere of Earth and uh, a capability to be able to predict volcano eruptions and other natural disasters that might happen on Earth. I hope that this system of monitoring from space will work a lot and it will be a breakthrough in science. The science work that the, the crews are doing, of course, is, is a big reason that you're there and, and there's more time being devoted to that kind of science work uh, as each expedition goes on. Uh, there are also times when there are strange and dramatic things that are going on. In your case, one of them is going to come in, in early November when you have crews coming and, and going and, and even for a short period of time there'll be nine people on board uh, all at the same time. Uh, tell me about what, what is happening in that period of time. It will be a very interesting period of time on orbit. It will start from the re-docking of the Soyuz Fedor Yurchikin. And right after that, a new vehicle will dock. The commander will be Michael Turin, and we will have three Soyuz vehicles docked at the station and nine people on board the station. It's a unique event. Uh, we will have a lot of people on board the station. And Sergei Rizansky and I will have a spacewalk within this time frame. We have, we'll have a couple of tasks for this spacewalk. But we will take the Olympic torch uh, with us to outer space. So we haven't had direct handover for a pretty long period of time. So nine people will be working on board the station at the same time. It requires a lot of coordination by the commander of the crew. We need to ensure safety of the crew and the station during docking, redocking events and during spacewalks. So it's important for the station, for the crew to be safe during this period of time. And it's like, imagine a situation when a lot of your relatives arrive to your house. So somebody is unpacking, somebody is just arriving, somebody is leaving, somebody is in the backyard planting something. So you understand this whole situation. So after this work, we will need a day or two to uh, relax and to uh, understand what happened. And the period when there will be all of that activity is, is less than a week. It's a four days, I think. Yeah, that's correct. Four days from the Michael Turin's docking until the undocking of Frederick Chicken's Soyuz. Let me get you to tell us some more about uh, the Olympic torch that you mentioned. Uh, whose idea was it to uh, bring the Olympic torch to the station and make it part of the torch relay? I don't know the names exactly who came up with this idea. But the idea to take the Olympic torch to space and to take it to outer space during the spacewalk was the idea voiced by Roscosmos. And GCTC, Aris Energia, and 
the cosmonauts corps supported this program and they had their own suggestions proposals how to make it more interesting for the general public so to, to make the olympic games even more popular and as you you said it's not simply just bringing the torch to the station you're taking it out into space with you right what what what's actually going to happen in in that uh, in that period of time we don't know that in detail yet how everything will look like but in general we I mean myself and Sergei Rizansky will take the Olympic torch outside the station we will take a picture with it, with the space station in the background, with the Earth in the background, and we will try to make sure that we see Russia and maybe Sochi, where the Olympic Games will take place. Uh, so we want them to be in the background. I think these will be very interesting videos and pictures that will be used to promote the Olympic Games. It will be interesting. Now, but that's not the only thing you're doing on that spacewalk, right? Uh, tell, tell me what the, the, the plan is for, for the rest of that EVA for you and Sergei. Of course, this task is only one of the tasks that we will have to perform during this spacewalk. This spacewalk is mostly devoted to the R&R &R of part of the hardware that is currently installed outside the station. We will be removing outdated old comb units. Maybe we will throw it away just pushing it in outer space and we will be replacing it with new hardware. We'll be routing cables, COM cables, computer cables, Ethernet cables. And we will be preparing the station to for, for the arrival of the new mod module. As you know, the new module is going to arrive to the station pretty soon, and the Russian segment has to be ready for that. So we need to replace a couple of antenna, hardware, we need to reconfigure COM cables outside the station. So these are the main tasks. You mentioned earlier that it's, you might need a few days to recover when uh, Fyodor Yurchikin's crew leaves and you get back down to, to six. And at that point, you become commander of the station for uh, Expedition 38. Um, how does it change your daily life to go from a flight engineer to, to be commander of the station? Well, talking seriously, I will have more responsibility. If you compare a flight engineer and commander job, the only difference here is that you are more responsible for the crew, for the station, but you are performing the rest of the work, so you have no privileges <laughs> here, you don't have special food or special drinks. I think the commander has to be one step ahead of the crew and uh, undertake the most difficult and maybe the most responsible assignments of the crew. So this is the most difficult part of this job. A few minutes ago we talked about the, the first spacewalk that is planned for, for you and Sergei. Uh, plans for spacewalks always are, are very fluid because the, cir the circumstances can change. Uh, are you planning at this point to, to have other EVAs during your time on, on uh, during this trip to the station? Yes. We have some more spacewalks, potentially most of them are devoted to the MLM arrival and integration. It's a new laboratory module of the Russian segment. Currently, 
is, is scheduled for late 2013. This module is devoted to experiments. That is why it has certain requirements regarding power supply, um, informational support. So in order to install and integrate this module, we will have a couple of spacewalks to ensure proper power supply, cables. We will install special panels outside the station. We'll be routing COM networks. So we will adapt this module for it to be able to accept um, cargo vehicles. It might take up to five additional spacewalks. So one of the goals of these spacewalks will be to activate a European robotic arm that will be delivered by the Russian laboratory module. It looks very much alike as the Japanese robotic arm and it will be mostly used for experiments to deliver some materials or hardware from uh, the airlock outside. So it's a very interesting program for us, for our mission. And as you said, the, the new module is, is currently targeted for delivery late in the year, but that could, of course, change. Any, anything on the, on the schedule could change. But nevertheless, uh, can you tell us more about the module itself and, and what sort of capabilities it's going to add to the station and, and especially to the Russian segment of the station? Yes, indeed, the launch and the arrival of this module slipped a couple of times. We unfortunately don't see it as part of the Russian segment yet. It's very unfortunate because this module will expand the technical capabilities of the station and of the Russian segment in particular. We will have new scientific hardware there to monitor the Earth, to produce new types of materials. We'll have special ovens inside this module. So where new alloys and new materials will be produced. And it will also improve the life support system of the station. We'll have new water recovery system, oxygen generation system. The one Russian ASU will be added there. One of the crew quarters will be moved there. So the module will be packed with scientific equipment. We will have an airlock there from which materials will be delivered to the outside of the station. From the crew standpoint, we will have a big window there and we will be able to take beautiful photos uh, of Earth. It's also, I think, not only will that be exciting to have all that new capability, uh, it's also going to lead to a change the, uh, because it's going to be installed where the piers module is now. Is that right? So, so the piers is going to be leaving? Yes, of course. After the launch of the MLM, the progress vehicle that will already be docked to the station, to the piers, will undock together with piers, so the crew will close the hatch from the other side of the piers module, and the vehicle will undock with piers, together with piers, and they will fly to Earth together. The peers proving uh, more of its uh, ability to do a lot of different tasks, not just to, to deliver cargo in that sense. And the station is actually now getting cargo delivered in a lot of different uh, spaceships, including a couple of, of new commercial ships from the United States. Uh, talk about the, the different vehicles and, and, and especially the ones that you think you're going to get to see uh, during this flight. 
Опять же, то, что мы увидим, наверное, зависит больше so от планирования полетов. Пока что... What we will see on board the station will depend on how our mission is planned and on the goals of our mission. First, we, of course, want to see all USOS cargo vehicles, Dragon, Orbital, maybe Cygnus. Что будет на самом деле, посмотрим. We'll see how it happens in reality. Программа на построена на некоторых изменениях. So as you know, the space programs, timelines tend to change all the time. It's like a living organism that is constantly changing. Ожидаю увидеть. In any case, I'm expecting to see at least two cargo vehicles, orbital and ATV that will be docked to the station when we arrive there. So, we'll keep working and the U.S. component of our crew are very well trained for the docking of such vehicles, for the work of such vehicles, and arrival of a new vehicle is always a good thing for the crew because they can deliver some surprises, some personal items or um, presents from Earth. It would be nice to see different kinds of vehicles come because they, they work in different ways. So you have different support jobs when they, when they do come, right? Yes, the operator's functions are absolutely different depending on where these vehicles dock to the Russian segment or to the U.S. segment and which crew is involved, U.S. OS or Russian crew. But in any case, all of us, the whole crew is participating in opening the hatches, loading, unloading these vehicles. So this is a common goal for everyone. During the last few weeks of, of your flight in space, the Winter Olympics are going to be kicking off down in, in Sochi, in, in Russia. Tell me what it's going to be like for you to be commanding an international space station while the world is gathering in your home, in your home country. It's a great honor for me and it's a great honor for me to be the commander of the ISS while Russia will be hosting the Olympic Games in Sochi. And we can see some common purpose between the Olympic Games and the ISS. These two projects are devoted to the improvement of the communication, interaction, cooperation of people, different countries, different cultures. It, both of them promote healthy lifestyle, both of them promote future development, technical development, development in our relationships between our countries. That is why the Olympic Games and the station are very much alike in this sense. But on the other side, as a patriot of my country, I will be supporting our team and wish them good luck. As you think about the mission that you fly uh, in space, do you have a, a sense of what is it that we are learning from your mission and the missions that you have built on and the ones that will come after? What are we learning from all these flights to the International Space Station that is preparing us, humankind, to move beyond Earth orbit and to explore further away in the future? Maybe here we should talk about a couple of aspects. First of all, we need this project for our future missions to deep space. We are making progress here and we have achieved great progress when we were developing the ISS. We have achieved great cooperation between two mission control centers, between teams of engineers, instructors, those people who fly to the station as part of international crews. So this is some sort of a basis for us to develop further 
Without this stage, further space exploration would be much more difficult and less efficient. I think that everyone agrees that all such missions need to be international because each country has its own experience, skills, knowledge, and combining all those assets will help us develop the deep space. On the other hand, missions to the ISS are very helpful for us if we make developments in life on Earth. All of us are explorers and we are traveling on such a big spacecraft and the life on board the station is a very good example how we can live on Earth, how we can understand each other, how we can build our relationships, how to cope problems and conflicts that might arise. You know, these conflicts might arise both on Earth and in space and how to move forward. From a technical standpoint, it's very important to understand how to make joint technical systems. So there is some technical standards already between two segments to make them compatible with each other. I mean, Japanese, USOS, Russian segments. And of course, we can use this experience to invent, create technical devices on Earth, in Russia, United States, Japan. We can really have something unique in the end.